Okay, let's see whether it works. Number of spin liquid states. Yeah, My name is Ivan Krebs, and I'm speaking to you from the University of Cologne. To enter the subject area, let me actually divert you to the field of topological mechanics. Topological mechanics was introduced by uh, Charlie Kane and Tom Lubensky in a very influential paper in 2014 where they discussed isostatic lattices and their floppy modes. What is an isostatic lattice? An isostatic lattice is one where the Maxwell counting uh, gives you a Maxwell index of zero and the Maxwell index is you know, the number of degrees of freedom in your system minus the number of states of self-stress. Let me give you examples of such isostatic lattices that you all know uh, in two and three dimensions. Um, a good indicator of whether a state, uh, a lattice uh, is isostatic is if the coordination number, the number of connected vertices for a, for a site in the lattice, uh, is twice the spatial dimension. You know, one example is the Kagome lattice in two spatial dimensions, which has coordination number four, or the pyroclo lattice in three spatial dimensions. So these are isostatic lattices and they will have floppy modes. But what is a floppy mode? That is best explained actually by going to a one-dimensional example, which I actually also brought to you here in this talk. So this is a one-dimensional lattice geometry, which, you know, in the bulk, you know, in the middle, you know, is very rigid, but it has a floppy mode, a moving mode, at one of its two boundaries, yeah, the second boundary. It's also rigid. And that, of course, reminds us yeah, of you know, the physics of topological insulators or you know, the SSH chain, yeah, bulk spectrum, uh, which are with a gap, but an edge spectrum you know, with a zero mode, a floppy mode. And then you have this solitary mode you know, where the zero mode can traverse through the system. The second example comes you know, from the ETH Zurich and the group of Sebastian Huber, who have nicely built you know, these classic pendula which you know, are connected at the top, yeah? so they're connected uh, pendula. And then, you know, if you excite a, a uh, pendulum at the, uh, uh, at the boundary, you, know, you see how a zero mode, an edge mode, you know, traverses you know, through this system you know, when looking at this pendula from the bottom. So this is the example, uh, which is you know, the best version of a you know, two-dimensional topological insulator in a classical mechanical system. So how does topological mechanics work on a conceptual level? So what we do is, you know, we connect you know, the physics of an electronic system to that of a mechanical system. And the way that this is done in topological mechanics is via a matrix correspondence. Yeah? And it works in the following way. You look at the mechanical system and the Newton's equation you know, that uh, describes it, and you take then you know, from this dynamical matrix in the Newton equation the square root yeah, which you then you know, plug into the Schrödinger equation of the electronic system and thereby you know, make this connection between you know, Schrödinger's equations, Newton's equations, between a matrix square root and the original matrix itself. And this uh, procedure we will look at in this talk from a slightly different perspective by identifying you know, the left side you know, with fermionic degrees of freedom, the right side with bosonic degrees of freedom, and the connection between you know, bosons and fermions, that is supersymmetry. So we will use the language of supersymmetry, apply it in the context of topological mechanics, but also many other uh, examples, and in particular explain you know, how this connects all to lattice geometries. This has been work that I started with my PhD student Jan Attic here in Cologne a few years ago. He just uh, graduated. Uh, we were later joined by uh, Christian Oichudu and Michael Lawler at the time, both uh, in, in Ithaca, New York, at Binghamton and uh, uh, Cornell. We have written three papers over the years. The latest one is on the archive uh, in July. And I actually will use you know, this latest paper uh, and its perspective to introduce you to the concept of supersymmetry in the way that we have done that in this paper. Let's start very gently by again looking at matrices. Yeah? So let's look at this Hermitian matrix, you know, which we request to have you know, this off-diagonal uh, block form. And you know, it might be some arbitrary matrix, but if we take the square of this matrix, yeah, we end up you know, with a, a block in diagonal form where the two blocks are R dagger and R dagger R. And by construction, you know, these two blocks yeah, will be isospectral. So they will have the same energy spectrum. So these isospectral spectra are actually something that you might be familiar with you know, when you think about you know, different tight binding models 
on lattice geometries. For instance, in this example, you know, we have here on the left hand side yeah, the conventional honeycomb lattice and you know, it's well known Dirac spectrum. Yeah? You know, we have this Dirac point at the, at the K point. And here on the right hand side, you know, we have a tight binding model on a Kagome spectrum, you know, which has identical spectra to the honeycomb. Yeah? Many of you will know this, yeah, that these two systems are either spectral up to a flat band, you know, which is an additional feature in the Kagome spectrum. But apart from that flat band, you know, these two spectra are identical. So they are isospectral. It will be spectra like these and lattices like these that we will connect in this talk via supersymmetry. So for instance, fermions on the honeycomb lattice are connected to magnons, bosons, on the Kagome lattice. You know, they will be isospectral up to you know, such zero mode flat bands uh, in this example. And we will connect them through a third kind of lattice that will I introduce uh, shortly and its spectrum. So to do this, let me you know, give you a more formal introduction to supersymmetry. So supersymmetry connects bosons and fermions and we can do this explicitly by introducing a supersymmetric charge operator that really goes from bosons to fermions. Yeah? So annihilation of a boson, creation of a fermion, that's what this operator does. And in between these two you know, operators there is an arbitrary uh, matrix R which we will call the rigidity matrix uh, in the following. And now if I take this operator Q and I square it by calculating you know, the commutator, I get the supersymmetric Hamiltonian. And if I actually calculate you know, this commutator, I will find you know, that the fermionic and the bosonic parts you know, of this Hamiltonian will completely decouple. Yeah? So there will be two blocks only in fermions and one block only in bosons. Yeah? And by what we have just discussed, you know, squaring a matrix, we will know now that these two uh, Hamiltonians, the fermionic and the bosonic ones, will have to be isospectral. Like in this example, yeah, you know, uh, where we connect fermions now on the square octagon lattice and their spectrum yeah, to uh, bosons on the squagomy lattice and their spectrum. And again, you know, these two spectra are isospectral up to you know, a zero mode, yeah, this flat band here, which you can associate with the Witten index of the supersymmetric theory. Yeah? So that's you know, the number of flat bands in the system and we can easily calculate it well, if we look at the matrices, we will look at the shape of the matrix R. If it's a square matrix, you know, that Witten index will be zero. If it's a rectangular matrix, yeah, if there is you know, a mismatch in the number of bosonic and uh, fermionic degrees of freedom, it will be rectangular. And then you know, the difference between uh, columns and rows yeah, will be the Witten index. Or you know, in the context of these lattice geometries, an even simpler way is to ask you know, how many sides are there in the unit cell, yeah, and that will tell you um, what's the mismatch you know, in these uh, two uh, 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 lattice geometries is and what the Witten index is, which is equivalent to the number of flat bands. So in this particular example, you know, the Witten index is two, indicating you know, that the uh, square Kagome lattice has two flat bands. The spectrum in the middle is the spectrum that we associate with the supersymmetric charge operator. Yeah? So the supersymmetric charge you know, is this lattice you know, which decomposes into you know, square octagon and square octagon lattice and its spectrum is the square root yeah, of the spectrum that we see here on the right hand side yeah, uh, as we see it here. But before we discuss you know, these, these spectra in more detail, let me actually try to explain to you how we can connect now lattice geometries via supersymmetry you know, which underlies you know, this idea as well. So let's talk about graphs and lattices. Yeah? The most general way, you know, talking about a graph or lattice is by identifying you know, the tight binding model, you know, the nearest neighbor hopping model for instance, yeah, with you know, the adjacency matrix of you know, that graph, that lattice. Yeah? So the adjacency matrix is one if two sides are connected, if there's a hopping element between them, otherwise it's zero. So for this very simple graph is four sides, yeah, which are connected you know, in this uh, uh, triangular fashion here, you know, that would be the adjacency matrix. Now, if I take a bipartite lattice, yeah, so a lattice that you know, decomposes into two sublattices, you know, one and two, and I want that only you know, coupling between you know, these two sublattices exists, yeah, this bipartite lattice will have an adjacency matrix that looks like this. Yeah? So it's off diagonal yeah, because you, know, you couple you know, sublattice one to sublattice two and vice versa, but there is no coupling within the sublattices. But if you square you know, the adjacency matrix of such a bipartite lattice, you know, then you end up yeah, with coupling only within the sublattices. 
Yeah? So, you know, taking two steps, two hops yeah, uh, in, in such a model always brings you back to the same sub-lattice for a bipartite lattice. So this allows us to describe, you know, lattice squaring yeah, uh, and, you know, in terms of adjacency matrices, also in a graphical representation. So if I have, you know, a bipartite lattice, you know, with a red and a blue sub-lattice, I can take, you know, these different features, you know, within the lattice, yeah, you know, two, uh, a fully connected side, you know, three fully connected sides, four fully connected sides. If I square them, you know, what I will actually end up is, you know, that I decompose, you know, the two sub-lattices, and what I get, you know, in the, in the red sub-lattice in this particular example is, you know, I bond a triangle, a fully connected square, yeah, uh, which is associated with, you know, the matrix square of the adjacency matrix. So, uh, the supersymmetric graph correspondence that we are talking about yeah, is one where the two uh, parts of the supersymmetric Hamiltonian, which you identify with fermion and bosons, now associate you know, with sublattice 1 and sublattice 2 of some graph, yeah? you know, which is occupied by fermions and bosons. So, for instance, if I take this graph, you know, whose one sublattice is a honeycomb lattice and whose other sublattice is a Kagami lattice, we call this graph you know, the honeycomb X lattice. You know, these are the fermionic, uh, this is the fermionic sublattice, this is the bosonic sublattice. That is, you know, the way uh, that these two uh, graphs are connected because they're sublattices of, you know, the same graph here in the middle. I can actually go from the square, uh, from, the, from the honeycomb lattice or from the Kagame lattice to the graph in the middle by taking a square root. Yeah, so I take the graph square root, which is, you know, inverting this graph construction that I showed you on the previous slide. Yeah, and I can go from this lattice structure by going from all the triangles to sides, thereby going from you know, the Kagame lattice to this honeycomb X lattice. And you know, the hopping model associated with this graph in the middle, you know, the honeycomb X here, that is the hopping model associated with the supersymmetric charge. And now you again see how that is the square root yeah, of these other two spectra. So if I take you know, this bosonic spectrum here on the right, I have three bands, you know, a zero mode and two dispersive bands. The zero mode, you know, uh, is also in the supersymmetric charge spectrum, and you know the quadratic band minima then become, you know, these Dirac-like uh, features in the Susy charge spectrum, and I have a total of, you know, five bands because, you know, there's two positive uh, bands here which have a positive and a negative square root. Yeah, so uh, this is the way, you know, that I can, you know, connect, you know, these lattice geometries uh, with one another. And you know what I you know do at the end of the day is you know that I uh, identify a fermionic model on sublattice A with via supersymmetry a bosonic model on sublattice uh, B and a you know supersymmetry charge model yeah on the entire bipartite lattice yeah these two lattices you know the fermion and the bosonic ones yeah they have spectra that are isospectral that are identical up to zero modes to be determined by the Witten index. Okay, I can do this also in three dimensions. Yeah, so uh, let me connect, you know, the diamond lattice to the pyrochlor lattice by going through what's called the diamond X lattice. So a diamond uh, lattice where on every bond I put an additional side. Yeah, this is a supersymmetric charge lattice, you know, which decomposes into these two bipartite, you know, sub lattices. Yeah, which are then either spectral up to zero modes, which again, you know, occur here in the pyrochlor lattice because it's a lattice with a larger number of sides in the unit cell. So that is how we can connect supersymmetry to graphs and graph constructions. So now let me connect, you know, supersymmetry also to topology by looking, you know, at features in, you know, the supersymmetric charge spectrum. So, you know, pretty generically, you know, these uh, charge, so these charge geometries, lattice geometries have nexus points. So they have Dirac-like crossings, whereas through the Dirac crossing, there's also a flat band, you know, going through. Yeah. In this particular example, you know, of the diamond X, uh, we have, like in the pyrochlor lattice, uh, we have a Witten index of two, so there's two flat bands, you know, that cross, you know, through this Dirac point. And we can, you know, uh, topologically classify whether these nexus points are, you know, interesting, have a topological invariant, are protected by topology, by classifying the underlying R matrices, you know, that discuss, you know, the, the hopping model on, you know, these, um, uh, Susie charge lattices, yeah, and uh, I can do this. For instance, you know, for symmetry class PD one, one of the five uh, chiral free fermion symmetry classes, and then dependent, you know, of the Witten index, whether it's one, two, three, four, I can make a statement about you know whether a topological invariant pi one, pi two, pi three, yeah, is trivial or non-trivial. 
So for the example here, uh, where the Witten index is 2, you know, if you have to look here, and you find, you know, that pi 2 can be non-trivial, and it is, yeah? So if I, you know, put a sphere around, you know, this uh, gamma point, nexus point, I find that the very curvature is indeed non-trivial, uh, and, you know, pi 2 is minus 1. So that's a topologically non-trivial nexus point on this diamond x lattice. And I can do such a, a classification of nexus points for all five chiral symmetry classes, giving me a five-fold way classification of such nexus points in the presence of you know, non-trivial Witten indices. So let's you know, put this supersymmetry uh, at play now and discuss its application in the context of frustrated magnets. The first thing that I want to discuss uh, are ground state manifolds. Yeah. And you know, for that, let me acknowledge that you know, typically if I look at a Heisenberg anti ferrer magnet, what I get as a ground state is a coplanar spin spiral. So as I traverse through the lattice, you know, spins will rotate, but they will rotate only within a plane. Yeah? And you know, such features are you know, quite ubiquitous and, and important ingredients. You know, if you want to you know, discuss multi you know, uh, spin textures, or you know, spiral spin liquids, which you will discuss here in this talk in just a second. If you want to discuss one coplanar spin spiral, all you will need to know is you know, the wave vector of that spin spiral. And then as you traverse through real space, you, know, you can calculate you know, in which point direction you know, the spin actually points. Let's start with a simple example. If you take the Heisenberg anti fermat on the triangular lattice, your um, spin spirals constitute so-called 120 degree order. There's two types of them, you know, which have you know, two Q vectors associated with them, which you can identify with a K and K prime point in the Brion zone. Yeah? So for you know, the 120 degree order, we have to memorize two Q vectors. But you know, there is interesting you know, anti magnets where you have more than you know, such a small number of Q points that actually describe you know, the ground state manifold. And you know, one system that nicely exhibits that are diamond lattice anti magnets, which are frustrated by your next nearest neighbor coupling. Yeah? So that's a model you know, which is relevant for a couple of you know, A-side spinal materials, uh, you know, which have you know, spins uh, between the quantum and the classical. Yeah? And if you look at you know, the ground state manifold of you know, these uh, anti magnets, you will find that the coplanar spin spirals you know, that constitute uh, the ground state are actually sub-extensive, uh, so there is a, a manifold of Q-vectors in momentum space uh, that describe you know, this degeneracy. Yeah? So the sub-extensive degeneracy is characterized by these manifolds, and you see how they change as you vary the J2 over J1, so the next nearest neighbor to nearest neighbor coupling of this model. Yeah? Uh, you see you know, how the geometry and topology of you know, these manifolds change. So I guess uh, you know, A-side spinels and these spiral spin liquids have been you know, subject of two other talks here, both Johannes Reuter and uh, Carlo Penck uh, are talking about spin spiral states. Uh, you know, I want to put, you know, my own flavor on this and, and discuss, you know, how supersymmetry can help to identify these. Let me say that this is uh, an interesting uh, discussion because, you know, for Mangan's constant of feet, you know, some 15 years ago, uh, you know, he predicted, you know, that, you know, such a spin spiral manifold will exist. And, uh, you know, some 10 years later, you know, Christian Wilk and his group at PSI actually have seen in Mangan's Kamsky exactly, you know, the spin spiral state uh, in experiment, uh, in neutron scattering experiments. If you think, you know, about these different spin spiral manifolds, you know, in the diamond lattice, you know, you, know, you might think, you know, when you see these manifolds, they look a lot like, you know, Fermi surfaces. Yeah? When you then think about the phase-centered cubic lattice, the FCC lattice, you know, some of you might remember that, you know, it's... Uh, uh, ground states are described by lines in momentum space you know, that are uh, located at the edge of the uh, first Brion zone, uh, reminiscent of nodal lines or nodal line uh, semi-metals. And you know, if we make that connection to, to metallic states, you know, then you know, the 210 degree orders of the 100 uh, 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 triangular lattice uh, are reminiscent of Dirac points. So points, lines, surfaces uh, are all possibilities here. So there's really a striking you know, connection between you know, spiral manifolds and Fermi surfaces. However, yeah, we have to acknowledge that you know, these spiral manifolds are ground states you know, of some classical spin model, while Fermi surfaces are typically a mid-spectrum feature yeah, in electronic systems. But this is precisely what we can now capture within that you know, supersymmetry approach that I just introduced. Uh, and uh, let me go through this uh, step by step. So for the spiral manifolds, uh, what I have to do is you know, I look at the uh, classical spin model and I might do a latin jatitsa approach where it takes the interaction matrix between these spins and I diagonalize that. Yeah? And, and diagonalizing this you know, will then give me a, a manifold of possible ground states. 
and I will identify this interaction matrix with the right hand side in my supersymmetry construction, so with R dagger R, so with the bosonic right hand side in my supersymmetry. Yeah? But now I'm interested in connecting that to a mid spectrum feature. And now I remember that that is actually the case for the supersymmetric charge. So the Fermi surfaces I will associate with a fermion lattice model yeah, that I associate with the SUSY charge through the middle yeah, of my you know, uh, construction. Yeah? So this Hamiltonian I, I uh, you know, refer to that. So that in my, my correspondence I will now have you know, a spin model which is either speckled to some other spin model yeah, uh, on you know, two sub lattices of some lattice and you know, the fermion model on the bipartite lattice that is then you know, the supersymmetric charge. Let me give you this you know, real example. So if you go back to the 120 degree order of you know, the Heisenberg antiferromagnet on the triangular lattice, well if I take another triangular lattice and combine them as two sub lattices into one you know, bipartite lattice, I end up you know, with the, uh, uh, the honeycomb lattice. And this is now my supersymmetric charge. Yeah? So the 120 degree order of this bosonic uh, 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 spin model here is then identified you know, as a Dirac point mid-spectrum in this Susy charge Hamiltonian. And thereby, you know, uh, I can make you know, this nice connection. You know, I know a lot about fermion models on, on, on you know, the honeycomb yeah, because of graphene, and all that knowledge I can now you know, sort of bring over to the 120 degree order uh, for, for this anti magnet. You know, this idea not only works in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions. So I, I uh, mentioned the FCC, the face at a cubic lattice before. If I take two FCC lattices, you know, together, you know, these two lattices constitute a bipartite lattice, which is the diamond lattice. Yeah? And then you know, this you know, nodal uh, line, yeah? so this uh, degeneracy in the, diamond lattice, uh, in the FCC lattice corresponds precisely yeah, to the Fermi surface of the diamond you know, free fermion model, yeah? which also has you know, precisely this nodal line at the edge you know, of the uh, Brion zone. Yeah? So I can really identify you know, spin spiral manifold and nodal line Fermi surface you know, in this example here. Um, let me you know, give you a third example. You know, the hyperoctagon lattice, you know, which is you know, close to my heart, you know, which looks like a three-dimensional uh, generalization of you know, the square octagon lattice. Yeah? It has, you know, interestingly, a, uh, an entire Fermi surface. Yeah? And if you then you know, look at its you know, sub lattices, what you end up is a three-dimensional Shastri Sutherland uh, model. Yeah, which would be a candidate for another you know, spin spiral surface in uh, momentum space, uh, which is also true. Yeah? So if you diagonalize you know, the, the interaction matrix for this you know, spin model, you get this entire surface. However, up in you know, checking the Lachina Titsa constraint, you know, it shrinks to a number of uh, points in this k space. So unfortunately, this is not a, a candidate for such a spin spiral surface. Nevertheless, you know, you know, supersymmetry is a very cool feature which now you know, lets us connect you know, spin spiral surfaces to Fermi surfaces in the way that I just introduced it. Let me give you another way where we can you know, connect spin liquids via supersymmetry. And now in this case, you know, we will go to quantum spin liquids and their parton dispersions. And for that, we will look at both you know, the square octagon lattice, but now as you know, the fermionic sub lattice of you know, some you know, more general lattice and you know, the hypercargomy lattice. Yeah? So the square octagon lattice has been you know, discussed by uh, some of us you know, in the context of 3D Kitaev materials and 3D Kitaev models, while you know, the hypercargomy lattice you know, has been discussed before uh, in the context of you know, this J1 half mod insulator you know, sodium iridate. Yeah? In the hyperoctagon lattice, you know, the Kitaev model, if you solve it, has a, uh, uh, you know, a at its uh, uh, zero energy band inversion spectrum, yeah, these Majorana Fermi surfaces. So there's a Majorana uh, spin liquid, you know, here in this in this model, you know, associated with the Z2 gauge theory. While for the hypercargomy, it has been discussed, you know, a few years early actually at what we have done, you know, the exact same cuts through the spectrum in the context of a spin on Fermi surface spin liquid with a U1 gauge theory, you know, in a paper by Michael Lawler and and collaborators. And these two uh, spectra are exactly identical, so they're SUSY identifiable. You know, through this lattice construction, going you know through this intermediate through the charge lattice. Now let me come to the uh, uh, example of topological mechanics and explain you know how we can you know rephrase topological mechanics in the context of supersymmetry and then construct you know interesting spin liquids uh, and and their mechanical analogs. Yeah. When I discuss topological mechanics, I uh, have phase space coordinates you know p and q, 
so real space and momentum space coordinate. So these are typically real boson degrees of freedom. And their most natural partner is going to be, you know, supersymmetry partner, it's going to be real fermions. So that is, you know, Majorana fermions. Yeah? And, you know, given that, you know, the dynamics of, you know, these, you know, bosonic degrees of these mechanical degrees of freedom is time reversal symmetric, you know, I'm led to write down a uh, Majorana fermion model, you know, which is in symmetry class BD1 having the same type of time reversal symmetry, uh, which I can do. Yeah? So I write down a Majorana fermion model, you know, in this symmetry class, which has this block off diagonal form. And now I can construct, we are taking, you know, this lattice square root, uh, you know, the local, uh, it's a local uh, Sully charge operator, which then connects, you know, Majorana fermions to, you know, bosonic, real bosonic degrees of freedom, yeah, on, you know, two different sub lattices. So this uh, Sully charge will have, you know, this block diagonal form. If I square it, I can go back to the Majorana fermion Hamiltonian, or I can square it and, you know, get to the real bosonic uh, Hamiltonian, which will also have, you know, this diagonal uh, block form. Yeah, and that's super important because what it tells me is, you know, that the dynamical matrix of this system, you know, decouples, you know, uh, real space and momentum space operators and thereby allows me to take a classical limit, you know, in some type of, you know, balls and spring model. Here's an example. Yeah, Majorana fermions on the honeycomb lattice are connected to, you know, real bosons on the triangular lattice. They are isospectral, you know, so here, you know, I actually have to look at the equations of motions, you know, for these classical mechanical systems to make this identification. What this tells me is, you know, that I can actually connect, you know, the honeycomb Kitaev model, you know, which has a spin liquid that I can describe in terms of my Urana fragments on the honeycomb lattice, you know, via a triangular bolts and string model that will have exactly the same type of spectra. So for, you know, equal uh, couplings in the Majorana model and thereby also in the spring model, I get the Dirac cone. While, you know, if I, you know, make one of these couplings a little stronger, you know, I will gap out, you know, the spectrum and, you know, uh, uh, reproduce that spectrum. It's interesting, you know, because, you know, both, you know, this Dirac cone is unusual because every single, you know, uh, 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 spring, you know, has a quadratic dispersion. Collectively, you know, they have this Dirac cone dispersion. You know, here, you know, I generated something that has a, you know, low frequency uh, rigidity. So there is absolutely no acceptation here in this system uh, that I have constructed this way. What's interesting about double logical mechanics and this real boson real fermion models is that it allows me to also introduce a new type of topological invariant. Yeah? So I can go in and uh, uh, explore the topological properties of the bosonic system by connecting it to the fermionic system, you know, know about the topology of the fermion system and go back and make a statement about the bosonic system. Yeah? And let me show you how that works. Yeah? If I start with a fermionic barrier curvature and uh, you know, uh, uh, look at the fermionic eigenstates, I can now go, you know, via supersymmetry and the rigidity matrix, you know, that describes you know, the supersymmetric charge to the bosonic eigenstates and applying supersymmetry another time, yeah, I can then define, you know, for the bosonic uh, uh, eigenstates and solely using those, a new type of uh, bosonic barrier curvature, which in addition, you know, to its, you know, uh, standard term has an additional uh, covariant derivative and, you know, this uh, higher order uh, berry phase, uh, berry curvature for, for bosonic system can be non-trivial uh, in examples where, you know, the conventional berry curvature is trivial. Yeah? So, for instance, you know, we can build higher order topological insulator uh, mechanical analogs, you know, where this way play a role. But let me, you know, come to an end because my time is up and uh, summarize for you uh, the following, you know, takeaway messages. First of all, you know, our paper uh, on the archive from, you know, a few weeks ago is probably the best uh, description of, you know, this entire framework, uh, you know, where we, you know, uh, use the concepts of supersymmetry, locality, and topology, yeah? So on supersymmetry, we connected bosons and fermions, and most interestingly, you know, we had, you know, varying bosonic degrees of freedom, you know, we had uh, uh, complex or real bosons, you know, we had spins, we had magnons, uh, we had mechanical modes, yeah, that we connected to fermions. Supersymmetry and locality, you know, allowed us to do this graph correspondence. And in topology, you know, we discussed, you know, novel types of bosonic uh, invariants, and we had this classification of the nexus points for the supersymmetric charge operator. You know, this was quite a unifying framework because we could discuss both frustrated magnets and topological mechanics, you know, using the same language. You know, uh, things like Maxwell counting, you know, can be discussed in both contexts, uh, ground state manifolds and uh, mechanical spin liquids. So, you know, check out, uh, you know, our papers for more examples of this. Uh, and uh, with that, 
I would like to thank you. I send you my regards, you know, from the University of Cologne, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for this uh, very, very nice uh, pedagogical talk. So, uh, do we have questions? Yes. So, can we extend this supersymmetric model if we mo have more than uh, two sub lattices? Um, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Then, then re please, please repeat your question. Okay. Uh, can we extend this supersymmetric model if we have more than two sub lattices? Um, no. So, so we need the two sub lattices. Uh, and exactly so, so it needs to be a bipartite lattice yeah mm -hmm. and then you know sub lattice a and sub lattice b will be in this correspondence so it wouldn't work uh, if you have three sub lattices or something like that okay okay thank you do we have, uh, okay do we have a question from online no uh uh, I have a question. The, uh, we were showing the different uh, spectrum, the three different spectrum when you were moving from one lattice, the papyrite one, to, uh, for example, for honeycomb to Kagome. And the lattice in between, I mean, if I were to try to understand it as a, a spectrum of magnetic excitations of a, of a system, it would correspond to the decorated uh, honeycomb lattice? or Exactly. So uh, it's. Um, if you go from the honeycomb, it's the decorated honeycomb. I call it honeycomb X. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which then connects to the cargo bay, and you can go through this construction for many, many, many different lattices, and, and there will connect them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the powerful uh, theme here, because in, in frustrated magnetism, we, we typically have bosonic models, you know, like the pyrochlor or the cargo bay, and, and we can connect them to uh, very simple fermionic lattices for which we know all kinds of things. You know, let me give you another example. If I, if I know something about this order uh, for fermions of the honeycomb lattice, I can translate everything I know to this order on, on the 120 degree state in um, the triangle lattice and ferromagnet. Yeah, so that's the power of this approach. Okay. And, and with related to what you were talking about, the cognitivity matrix, when you are in the decorated uh, version, the cognitive mat matrix is uh, usually rectangular, is that correct? Um, yeah, so, so most, most typically, you know, it is rectangular because, you know, you're connecting something like, you know, the, the honeycomb to the cargome, and because of the mismatch in, in number of sites in the unit cell, that, that is also what, what makes this rectangular, and it also the reason why at the end of the day you have these flat bands, yeah. And of course, you know, flat bands is, is what we know is a source of degeneracy, uh, of interest in physics and frustrated magnetism. Yeah, and, and now, you know, by very simple counting, I can tell you whether the cargome or the squagome or, you know, the three-dimensional chassis Sutherland or whatever yeah has you know one two or three you know flat bands yeah okay are there any other question in the audience yeah um you mentioned the, the connection between parton theory um that you can go from this fermionic um, parton theory to the bosonic one um, do you know if also the PSG classifications of a fermionic one would um, connect to a bosonic one? Yeah, so that's a very nice question, and uh, so that, that's something that needs to be explored. So, so I don't know. Yeah, um, but you know, since you know that that everything that's on the fermionic side will translate somehow to the bosonic side, you know, you should expect that there is something interesting happening on the fermionic side. You will have it on the bosonic side as well. Yeah, so sometimes it comes with this extra twist, like in the barrier curvature, you know, that you have to sort of look at this higher order barrier curvature instead of, you know, the conventional bosonic barrier curvature to, to identify that the bosonic system is interesting. Yeah, um, but, but then all of a sudden it reveals itself. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you very much, Simon, for this very nice talk. Uh, it was my first one seeing a presentation online like this in Zoom. It, it works well. So, uh, 